Welcome to Uncomplicating Weight Loss and Life. I'm your host, Eva Rodriguez, proud Latina, single mom, certified life coach, and weight loss coach. I'm here to help high achieving boss women lose their weight for the last damn time and up level their lives. When it comes to your health, weight loss, and this thing called life, I'm not saying it'll always be easy, but it doesn't have to be complicated. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about how to learn to trust your body. And I think this is so important for so many of us, especially if we're on a weight loss journey and we have had the diet trauma, we have the diet mentality, and we're trying to get out of the diet mentality. So what's really important to keep in mind throughout this episode is I want you to think about this in the lens of getting out of your head and into your body. And the way to do that really requires that you have complete faith in yourself, right? So trust is complete faith in the reliability of something. So in this case, I want you to think about trusting in knowing and having that faith that you know what's best for your body, even if you don't think you do. So trust is the opposite of control. And oftentimes with the diet culture and having a diet mentality has us thinking that the only way to lose weight and keep it off is to be very controlling, is to be very restrictive and to follow very strict rules and put yourself almost in this box where you can't enjoy life and you can't enjoy anything, really, any of the enjoyable things because dieting has been known to be such a miserable experience. And I don't want that for any of us. I don't want any of us to have to live our lives having to choose between either being miserable and and thin or in shape or whatever that means for you and being able to enjoy life and not go off the rails and not eat all the things. So we want to find that balance. And the way you find that is by learning to trust your body. So many of my clients come to me in, in the beginning of their journey thinking that they don't know how to trust their body. They don't know how to trust themselves around food. They don't know how to trust themselves around the things that they're used to being triggered by. And I want you to start thinking about the idea that if you haven't trusted yourself before, if you haven't trusted your body before, you can change that. You can start changing that right now with the steps that I'm going to share with you. So I'm actually going to share with you some pillars, what we call the pillars of trust, and and how to start applying them into your day-to-day life. This is an entire journey. This isn't one thing. And I think with most of the concepts that I teach, it's not something that you'll do a couple times and then like, oh yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm good at trusting my body now. It is an ongoing journey throughout our life, especially if you've been if you've been disconnected from yourself, if you've been disconnected from your body. So if you think that you can't control yourself, for example, around foods, then of course you won't trust your body to tell you when it's had enough. Right. Of course, if you think that thought, like I just it's I'm I don't know what to do. I don't know how to how to stop. I don't know how to act when, you know, pastries come along or, or they just talk to me. And, you know, we do all these things where we create these stories in our heads of I can't control myself. Right. Um, control happens in our minds. And I know I talk about this a lot in my episodes of of how our thoughts create our feelings and our feelings create our actions and our results, right? You literally create any result that you have in your mind, any result that you have in your life is created with your mind. It's created with the thoughts that you have. So because control happens in our minds, it's done without awareness or connection oftentimes with ourselves, with our body. So trust has to be developed within It's always an inside job. All of this work that we do, all of this work that we're doing on the weight loss journey, it's an inside job. I know that we think so much it's outside because it's external. It's how you look. It's what the mirror reflects. It's what the skill is reflecting. But it all has to happen within. So I'm going to teach you some of the steps, some of the framework of how to get out of your head and how to get into your body and how to check in with yourself throughout the day so that you're able to honor your needs at all times. So there's three pillars of trust, and this is a concept that I learned from my coach and my mentor, Corinne Crabtree. And the three pillars are understanding, commitment, and protective care. And when we understand our body, and we understand how our body works, 
we're able to commit to ourselves and commit to protectively take care of ourselves. This is literally the foundation, the basis of self-care, self-love. And I know I talk about this a lot as well, about how self-care has really little to do with the bubble baths and the facials and all of that. Self-care is all about how you're taking care of what your body needs, what your what your soul needs. That is all self-care. That's where it all comes from. And then we also have to remember how our nervous system works and how it affects our body. Because the more you understand that, the more you understand how the systems inside of your body work, that's how you're able to really put all of this into play. So how your brain communicates with your body is really important to understand. Because our brain is, it's basically the command center for all of our thoughts and all of our actions and all of our responses. Our brain sends signals to our body through the nervous system. So if your nervous system is completely out of whack because you're stressed out, because you are not taking the time to really go within, really have a moment to decompress, then your brain isn't able to send the right messages. It's not able to send the messages that are going to get you out of that fight or flight mode if you're always in fight or flight mode. So these signals vary. The signals that our brain sends us, they often vary depending on your perception of safety. And the only way that you can trust yourself and your body is if you feel safe, right? Because obviously you won't, you can't trust a person if you don't think that they're a safe person, right? So it's the same thing with our body. Even though it's your body and you live in it, because so many of us are disconnected, there's a huge disconnect as well between our brain and our body, which creates that distrust. So there's two parts of the brain. There's your habit brain and its number one job is survival. That's it. So it has three goals. It's to keep you safe, avoid pain, seek pleasure, and use as little energy as possible. That is basically what the brain does. That's the habit brain. Then we have the conscious brain. So if you hear me talk about prefrontal cortex versus primitive brain, our prefrontal cortex is the conscious brain. So when the brain feels threatened in any way, it will go into survival mode. And your brain doesn't know the difference between I'm having a really stressful day and that's why I'm, you know, my nervous system is heightened versus if we think about primitive times when we didn't know if there was gonna be a puma waiting for us in the bushes when we were coming out of the cave to get food, right? The brain doesn't know the difference yet. So it will perceive threat. It will perceive you having an argument with your partner, with your with your boss, um, having a bad day. It will perceive that as threat. It will perceive that as we're not safe. We need to do something to get safe. So understanding that the way that our brain works is really the first step in getting to that place where you're learning how to trust your body. And there's two potential avenues here. So there's fight or flight, right, where you're very activated and you're trying to either fight an attack or run away from an attack. And then there's the freeze, right, where you have little to no energy and you shut down. When our brain is in a survival response, there is no room for the conscious brain, for the prefrontal cortex to come on, to turn itself on. And this is why when your brain feels like it's in overdrive or you feel like you have no energy, it seems like all of the goals that you have or all the plans that you made, they don't even make, they don't even register when you're in that heightened state of stress. Our brain is too busy trying to survive. And so many of us live our day-to-day -day lives in that survival mode and we don't even realize it. And all of us have a unique nervous system, right? One might have more energy flowing than the other. Some people um, are wiring based on our past experiences. If you've had any trauma, if you've had anything like that that will impact your nervous system, then it will also affect your ability to connect with yourself. It'll affect your ability to really get out of your head and into your body because oftentimes if we have trauma, you don't want to relive it. You don't want to take yourself back there. And just a quick note on trauma, there's what we call two types of trauma, right? There is big T and little t, right? So big T trauma, for example, it's abuse. It's loss of a loved one. It's grief. It's it's something that, um, that maybe like an accident or something that has taken you and has really affected not just you mentally, but has also affected your body because you've internalized it. That's big T trauma. Then we have little t trauma. 
right? Little T trauma is just as important and it's often forgotten, right? Oftentimes when we think, when we hear the word trauma, we think, or even like PTSD. I know when I was first diagnosed with PTSD, I was like, I've never been to war. Like I, I don't have PTSD. I didn't understand that there's different levels of trauma and there's different ways that it affects us. And there's different ways that it affects not only how we think, not only how our, how our brain gets wired, but also how we show up in the world. So little T trauma really is not getting your emotional needs met? Did you have disconnected parents when you were growing up? Um, Did your parents get a divorce? That can be traumatic for a lot of children. Um, Was there food scarcity? Was there, were you forced to eat all of the food on your plate even if you weren't hungry? Oftentimes where it begins with our distrust with our body and our inability to really tap into our intuition is I used to have to eat everything on my plate or I would get in trouble or I wouldn't be able to eat dessert afterwards or we would get guilted into thinking, you know, well, there's kids in Africa who don't have any food as if me eating the food on my plate has any effect on the child that is starving. It doesn't. Right. But we are fed these stories. Right. Because. People are well intended, but we're fed these stories and they they can cause so much. That's where the diet trauma comes from as well. There's also, you know, if you were bullied, a lot of us were bullied growing up. That's little T trauma. It's not just get over it. It really does affect us as we get older. We bring all of that. It's like we put all of our traumas, whether there's big T or little T, we put it all in a bag and we carry that shit around with us everywhere we go. It's just an imaginary backpack or an imaginary purse with all of our shit in there. And so it's really, really important to to just notice it and normalize that if you have trauma, that does affect how your brain is wired. That genuinely does affect it. And it's There's nothing wrong with you. I always say there's nothing wrong with you if you've had any of these things happen. And if you need help, I always say if you need help by processing to to process these things, I always encourage everyone to seek all the help that they need. Seek mental health assistance if you have any type of trauma, big T or little T, because of the way that truly does affect everything that we do. And it obviously does affect whether or not we trust ourselves, whether or not we trust our body, whether or not we trust that we know what's best for us, because sometimes we think that we don't. Sometimes we think that an an expert knows more about us and knows more about our own body than we do. And that's why, because of that disconnect. So one of the things that you want to start doing when you're when you're learning to trust yourself, finding home base. So home base is where you're most able to access your conscious brain. And this is where you're able to best function in your life. So when you're in your home base, you are able to set your goals. You're able to to face your challenges and adjust accordingly and pivot if you need to. You're able to tolerate discomfort. You're able to respond to to the things that come to you, that, that come at you in your life in ways that are aligned with your goals. When you're in your home base, your nervous system is able to be calm and it's able to relax. And your brain doesn't sense any threat to its survival. It doesn't think that small things that pop up are a threat because your conscious brain is in its full capacity and it's able to continue to grow and evolve you. So home base is your zone for optimal functioning. So I want you to start thinking about how do I find my own personal home base so that I can start getting out of my head and getting into my body. When it comes to things like binging, things like emotional eating, things like um, not quite understanding what your body's cues are, I just always want to offer you're not broken. Just because you binge, just because you eat emotionally, just because you're not quite connected yet doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. Because what's happened is that we've just conditioned ourselves to react to anything that feels uncomfortable by avoiding it. A lot of us avoid it with food. A lot of us feel that if we eat to forget or if we eat for comfort, then that's how we feel better. But then we judge ourselves and we beat ourselves up and then we think something's wrong. Then we think we're broken. Then we think I'm never going to be able to stop overeating. I'm never going to be able to stop binging. I'm never going to be able to stop being an emotional eater. And then we beat ourselves up, right? So when we can understand that this all makes sense, 
all of what we've experienced in our lives has gotten us to where we are right now. So it makes sense that you have your brain wired in that way. Then you're able to just give yourself that grace that I always talk about and you give yourself that compassion. And that's how you learn to trust and believe and have faith that you can unlearn bad habits. You can unlearn the the negative thought loops that you've been conditioned over and over and over again over the years to believe. When we realize that we're not broken, that's when we're able to give ourselves compassion. You can't give yourself compassion from a place of judgment and a place of shame. Compassion and nurturing are two very key components when it comes to connecting to and learning to trust your body. So two very key components to trusting our body is compassion and it's nurturing. Remember when we first started the show, we're talking about the definition of trust. One of them is protective care. We provide ourselves with compassion when we protectively care for our hearts, for our body, and for our mind. Briefly, I wanna talk about the two types of compassion, yin compassion and yang compassion. So yin compassion is gentle, it's nurturing, it's loving. So if you find that you have an urge, you're acknowledging, of course I have an urge. I'm used to having these urges. I'm used to this. I'm used to thinking that in order to feel better, I need to go and eat something or I need to go and do something to avoid, right? So of course that makes sense. Having yin compassion means I'm going to love myself through this. There's this question that um, one of my mentors, Brooke Castillo, which is um, the founder of the Life Coach School, which she says to us all the time is when you're in that place of despair or in a place of disconnect and you want to judge yourself, it's just asking yourself really gently, what's the matter? What's the matter, love? And if you ask yourself that, that's how you're able to get, once again, out of your head, get into your heart. What's the matter? And then you're able to process much easier when you're not coming from a place where you're beating yourself up and you're judging yourself because you had an urge or because you gave into an urge. Just ask yourself, what, what is it that I really need right now? What's the matter? And then there's yang compassion, and that's firm and protective, right? So you can say to yourself, I know that you really want to have that ice cream or that donut or that cupcake, but you know that that's not going to help you get to your goals. This isn't what you need. Food is not going to fix this. We're not going to do this today. This is what makes me stronger. This is how I'm able to undo this thought pattern. So think about the two sides of it. Neither of them are tough love. Neither of them are beating yourselves up. Neither of them are berating yourself or talking shit to yourself or judging yourself. They're being compassionate, but one is soft and one is firm. And those are the two different kinds of compassion that I want you to start thinking about. And give both of them equal airtime as you're going through this process. Compassion is very different than permission. So when we meet ourselves with care, with concern, with compassion, we're more likely to guide ourselves into a path that feels more nurturing, that feels more aligned with our goals. So we apply both the yin and the yang compassion as we become loving and nurturing, almost like a loving parent to ourselves. And the more that you can gain awareness of the times when you tend to overeat, when you tend to get off plan, the easier it is to prepare yourself, to prepare to meet yourself with compassion, with self-compassion at those times. You may not always be able to access all of your thoughts, right? In the midst of turmoil, in the midst of an urge, in the midst of an overeat. And that's okay because so many of our thoughts are on autopilot, we don't even realize that they're there. They're there, but when you're giving yourself that compassion, you're just turning the volume down. The turning the volume down of those thoughts that are constantly circling in your, inside your head. And if you can't find the thought that you're having, sometimes you're able to find the feeling that you're having. So if you ask yourself, what was I feeling before 
I had this binge, before I overate. That can also help you because our thoughts live in our head and our feelings live in our body. And your feelings are the way that your body communicates with you. So it's really important to listen to how your body is feeling because our feelings are always there and they influence every single thing that we do. And how you experience the feelings in your body oftentimes depends on your nervous system. So we talked about the nervous system earlier in the episode. So you might feel your emotions very, very deeply, or you might feel completely detached from your emotions. So if you have a regular habit of overeating, you've likely developed it in order to avoid certain feelings or to try to create certain feelings. There's this process that I teach now in Nurture. It's N-O-W, so N is name the feeling, O is open up to it, and W is witness it. And then you nurture. Nurturing is how we care for ourselves. So when we overeat, there's often this underlying need that we're not addressing. We approach overeating or binging with compassion and curiosity using this now and nurture process instead of judgment, instead of beating yourself up. So when you identify the need and then you nurture yourself by meeting the need in a more fulfilling way than food, that's when you start to find your breakthrough. That's when you start to trust what your body's actually telling you. Because when we have urges, there's two layers of emotions that are happening. The first layer is what you want to escape, whether it's anger, overwhelm, worry, frustration, shame. And then the second layer to an urge is the desire to eat, the urge, essentially, whatever it is that you're urging. So the goal of the urge isn't to not eat, The goal of an urge or any emotion is to allow it to pass. It will pass on its own if you allow it to. And once you let it pass, then you get to see what are the messages there. And this applies to not just urges to overeat, urges for anything. Urges to text your ex, urges to go shopping when you don't really need to. Urges to spend an hour on social media instead of doing that thing that's more important. Whenever I talk about these things, whenever I talk about urges, you can always substitute whatever it is that you have an urge to do that's not going to help you get to the goal that you have in your brain. So we're not trying to make the urges go away. We just want to understand what is this urge really saying? What is this really offering us right now? What is it that we really need to dive into? Your ability to be with an emotion as it travels through your body is how you start to trust your body. Once you've allowed those urges to be there, the other emotions that you were looking to escape, they're not going to necessarily go away immediately. And this is the hard part of allowing an urge to come and go. But you can increase your emotional capacity to be with those emotions rather than reacting to them by using the now and nurture process. Remember, your body is always communicating with you. It's always sending you cues. It's always sending you signals. But we aren't always paying attention. Listening to your body's signals is something that while we know how to do innately, a lot of us have forgotten or we have suppressed it throughout our years. But that ability is still within you. It's just waiting to be uncovered. It's just waiting for you to take the step the first step, step one on learning how to trust your body. We tune in to understand what our body's telling us and what our needs are. And then we commit to protectively care for ourselves just like we would a best friend or our child. Our bodies will always tell us what it needs, both as it relates to our emotions and our physical sensations. And when we develop the skill of listening to and trusting our body, we can shift from using external cues like portion sizes, macros, the scale, our clothing size to tell us how much to eat or what to do. We switch from external to internal. Internal cues like our emotional state, internal cues like the physical sensations that we have when we're hungry or we're thirsty or we're tired. The trust process For eating, T would be take your temperature. So remember, home base is the ideal state to get the most benefit from anything that you're trying to accomplish, especially when it comes to food. One good thing that you can do is use your breath to bring you either up or down into your home base zone as needed. The second step in the trust process is R, repeat. Repeat your intention. Have an intention or a mantra or an affirmation every time you sit down to eat. And then we have you, number three, the third step of this process, understand your needs. Check in to see if you have any underlying needs before you sit down and eat. Be aware that underlying needs may lead to more urges 
to overeat, more urges to emotionally eat. Develop a plan to address your needs after the meal. Then there's S. Use all your five senses. Sight, smell, touch, sound, and taste. And the last step is T. Take your time. Put down your fork while you're eating. Chew thoroughly. Savor the meal that you're having. Don't just gulf it down while you're doing 10 different things. Take your time to enjoy whatever that is. And if you're having an urge and you actually say, you know what, I'm actually gonna give into this and I'm gonna eat this, at least enjoy it. Savor the experience, but listen to your body. Listen to the signals that it's giving you. And do all of this, this entire trust process with compassion and with grace. You can use the trust process to develop deeper connection with yourself and learn how to listen to your body and learn how to listen to what your body's telling you and the cues that it's sending you. Let your body tell you when and how much to eat. Not some influencer, not some diet, not some guru, not your cousin, not your best friend, not your boyfriend. Don't let anyone tell you what you need for your body because only you know and you're the best person that knows. Your needs are constantly changing throughout your life for a variety of reasons. That's why it's so important to be flexible. It's so important to be okay with pivoting. Be willing to listen to and honor your body's hunger signals. Some days you're gonna be really hungry, some days you're not. That's normal. Be okay with that. Be okay with the ebbs and the flows. Check in with yourself before, during, and after your meals just to see what's happening inside your body. And I want you to look for and get very familiar with your hunger cues and your fullness cues. The more that you're able to develop trust with your body, the more you'll be willing to actually give it the space and the airtime and the attention that it's been screaming for this whole time that you've been possibly ignoring it, possibly telling it to sh be quiet. The more that you're able to develop this relationship with yourself and acknowledge that sometimes we're feeling shitty emotions, and that's okay. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It doesn't mean that something went wrong or that something's not working. It's just your body telling you what it needs. We only have one body. So it's time to develop a better relationship with the one and only body that you have. That's all for today. Bye for now. Thank you so much for tuning in and trusting that none of this has to be complicated. You can have the health, the body, and the life that you've always desired. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Find me on Instagram and YouTube at It's Eva Rodriguez so that I can support you on your journey of uncomplicating weight loss and life.